Uh, so I'm going to start off uh, the presentation talking a little bit of, about our findings in the studies, but also more broadly about the trends that we're, we're seeing in AI and, and especially uh, the intersection of optimization technologies. And then we're going to turn it over to Ed, who's going to uh, uh, talk to you about optimization uh, more directly in terms of uh, financial services. Um, so this is part of a study that we did in conjunction with Garobi. Uh, and this is some of the respondent demographics. Uh, and our goal here was to really focus on financial services. And so you can see the the roles in, in the companies and the size of the companies uh, in this. I'm not going to go through, through all of this data, but you can see that there is a financial services focus here. Um, and one of the questions we asked is, what are a company's plans when it comes to optimization technologies? And you can see about 50% are planning to implement uh, in the next uh, uh, 12 months. Many are expanding. I mean, there's no one that that is decreasing or removing. You can also see some data uh, here about how important optimization is uh, in, uh, in terms of the business needs. And we're gonna talk a lot more about this. Um, but let me uh, turn this over to the AI trend uh, so we can see what's happening in the world of AI and, and explore the intersections uh, be between AI uh, and optimization. Um, and really what, what you're going to see is that optimization is really a key AI technology along with machine learning. When we ask uh, our large global enterprise uh, uh, clients and clients in general, uh, those that say they've implemented some form of AI, uh, it's overwhelmingly uh, positive results. Uh, and we expect this to continue. We know from our, our survey data uh, that we started in about 2014, the adoption has been slowly marching upward and we believe AI is a fundamental technology and that nearly 100% of enterprises will adopt it in some form, whether it's custom and they do custom models, which we believe they'll do, and also buying AI technologies that are embedded in business applications. So we see a very, very rapid uh, increase and momentum in the adoption. And there's tons of use cases because essentially when you have a large global enterprise and you have all of these business processes and customer engagement processes, there are decisions uh, that are necessary to be automated and made uh, in all of these business processes. Uh, and when you start to count the number of use cases across uh, both the vertical and horizontal, uh, quickly adds up into the hundreds uh, and if not the thousands. And when you think of financial services in particular, um, uh, it's on the upper end of this. So we need to sort of level set what we mean by AI because a lot of people uh, say AI and ML in the same breath. We don't believe that these are the same thing, right? AI is much broader and, and AI broadly means it's software, because we are talking about software here, it mimics or exceeds human intelligence to make a decision, to find a pattern, to formulate new knowledge. So uh, it's very distinct from the technologies used to actually achieve AI. Now, clearly machine learning is one of those technologies, but AI solutions are free and do use any number of technologies, including mathematical optimization, machine learning, decision logic, um, other mathematical methods. Uh, so, so AI is a broad category and there's technologies underneath it. Now, machine learning due to um, many factors, including some breakthroughs in deep learning in 2012 is an extraordinarily popular approach. Um, and it's an approach that most companies will uh, most definitely uh, use or, or will use that's embedded in software. Um, mathematical optimization uh, is also a core AI technology, and it's incredibly complementary uh, to machine learning. And I'm going to explore uh, how in a, in, a, in a second here. Um, and I'll first illustrate that through a few use cases, right? So you could use a machine learning model to predict that there's a supply chain issue. Um, so, so machine learning models are predictive models, so they could predict. But then what do you do about it? Well, then you could use mathematical optimization to decide the least costly way to reroute those shipments, 
right? You could, you could use machine learning to predict a price movement um, in the market, right? But then how do you allocate resources across that with your various uh, risk tolerance constraints and, and other constraints that you may have? Mathematical optimization, perfect complementary technology to that. You could use machine learning to predict what offers to make customers, perhaps a loan, another card, uh, uh, some sort of financial uh, or insurance instrument. But then you can use machine, uh, machine uh, mathematical optimization to determine, well, how much should I actually allocate towards this? How should I optimize uh, the discounts that I'm actually uh, providing these customers to meet my objective? and it may be to maximize res revenue or maximize profit. Um, and certainly in the world of IoT and manufacturing, you can use a machine learning model to predict that a machine's gonna fail. Oh, okay, well, do you just wanna shut it down right now? Not necessarily. You can use optimization technology to determine, okay, when's the best time to shut it down given the constraints of customer orders, important customer orders, labor resources and, and other factors, energy uh, consumption. Uh, so these are incredibly complementary um, and certainly in financial services, predicting any particular risks and then using mass mathematical optimization, where to invest, where to hedge, how to um, uh, uh, mitigate uh, those risks. And, and ultimately all of this, all of these use cases uh, are about making decisions. Some of those decisions you're going to make or your teams are gonna make, some of those decisions need to be automated uh, in a process. Um, so AI is very, very complementary with other software decision-making technologies and AI is comprised of different technologies. And this is how we can maximize the value of AI by combining complementary technologies that I just illustrated, machine learning and mathematical optimization together. Um, so uh, both of these technologies are very unique and each one of them has different challenges. Um, and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but in summary, machine learning is a very data intensive uh, challenge. Mathematical optimization is uh, has fewer data requirements, but is uh, very challenged in terms of the compute uh, necessary to do it. Um, so it's it's very common for a single AI use case to actually yield millions in, in top and bottom outcomes. And we I've seen this, I talk to companies every week, uh, financial services companies and other companies for that matter, uh, who are describing these types of use cases. And the sentiment right now with <laughs> Uh, many enterprises, how can we accelerate this? How can we accelerate the number of use cases? How can we take the use cases that we have uh, and, and increase the value of those? Now, if we actually look at how, do the, how does machine learning and mathematical optimization, how can they actually work together? Um, I, dem I illustrated some of that through some of those use cases, but machine learning predictions can determine the need to make a mathematical optimization decision. And that's essentially what I showed you. I showed you a supply, math, machine learning predicted supply chain disruption, mathematical uh, optimization can make the decision. Um, but predictions can also be used as a constraint in mathematical optimization. So in a mathematical optimization problem, you're gonna have certain constraints that are that you're going to optimize to, to meet an objective, machine learning can provide a prediction to that variable. Um, and that can actually make the result a little bit more accurate. Um, but they can also be uh, used in the reverse. So a, math, a mathematical optimization decision can be used as a feature uh, in, in machine learning. Uh, so uh, these are complementary in, way, in, in many different ways, in, in ways that they can be used together, but also one can be the input or the output of the other. Uh, so that can be very, very valuable as well. Um, and this is another example of how a decision can be used in inferencing in a downstream predictive model as well. Um, netting this out though, uh, 
uh, machine learning is very is is best at predictions, and mathematical optimization is best at making decisions, especially uh, when you have uh, constraints and a very specific objective in mind. Um, one of the data points that we gathered in the study is we asked what challenges those organizations face when combining mathematical optimization and other advanced analytics technologies such as machine learning um, and too much market information. Um, and that's more of a, uh, a problem when you're doing data and analytics, privacy concerns, market information's changing, skill sets. So some of these are, you know, we've heard for, for a few years now. Um, so that, that's a quite interesting result. Um, we also um, ask companies, what areas are they investing? Um, and you can see using other technologies such as machine learning in conjunction with mathematical optimization, investing in newer mathematical optimization technologies. So you can see uh, from this data uh, that financial services firm, they want to combine these two technologies. Uh, they largely uh, see the benefit of that. And some of this data that I'm showing you absolutely encourage you to look at the fuller report um, fr from this, because you'll see a lot more detail in that. Um, so uh, what we, um, uh, what our research has shown at Forrester and what we promote to our clients is to think of these two technologies uh, together. Don't use one necessarily without the other. Any particular use case you have, map, don't, don't make an, if it's an AI use case, don't make it just a machine learning or just a mathematical optimization, but see if there's an opportunity to use these together because uh, the overall uh, business outcome uh, can, can grow. Now let's turn back a little bit more to the AI in general and see what's driving uh, some of the um, uh, AI. Uh, and the first one is the one I alluded to before which is there's so many use cases in global enterprises. Financial services firms actually, <laughs> I, I think of them as technology firms. And when, whenever there's some new technology or trend, financial services firms are usually on the front of that, um, kind of exploring new ways to, to optimize their business, new ways to um, uh, expand their market. Um, and there are thousands of use cases. And the way companies find these use cases is by walking through their, their current business process. And again, asking, is there a prediction I could make? Hmm, that's potential for machine learning. Is there a decision that gets made here? Hmm, there's a potential to uh, use mathematical optimization here. Uh, most enterprise use cases remain unimplemented. So <laughs> we are looking forward at, at, at tremendous momentum. Uh, it's just getting started here. Um, so the more models, whether they're machine learning, mathematical optimization models, the more benefit uh, companies are going to gain. And, you know, what I said from the beginning is we think that AI is a fundamental technology, very similar to how companies may have questioned in the past in the 90s, like, well, do we, are we ever going to really need a website or a mobile app? Yeah, of course you are. Um, AI is, is similar, and we think we've reached the tipping point where most enterprises understand that. Uh, second thing driving adoption here um, is machine learning requires data. This is a little bit inaccurate, which says AI requires data. It's actually machine learning technology requires a, a lot of rich data uh, to do that. And that's because the data represents what's physically happening in the world. If you have the telemetry and companies uh, uh, increasingly do. And, and what physically happens in the world for financial services, there's a lot that people think of it as, as more of an information company, but there's a lot of physicality to these businesses. Insurance, events that happen to homes or cars, financial services, customers uh, clicking on mobile apps or going to ATMs, uh, investors taking actions on their portfolio. This is, these are actually physical. And then there's all the digital events that goes along with that. Um, and it, ultimately, this represents uh, customer events in any companies. And the, the good news is that financial services enterprises are very flush with industry-specific data uh, that is necessary to build these models. So here's just a smattering, an example of the type of data 
um, that enterprises have. And all of this data can be relevant uh, to, to machine learning models. It's all siloed. And so companies have worked to create a combination of data warehouse technology and data lake technologies to have machine learning models to analyze this. So this too is driving, um, uh, driving uh, uh, machine learning technology uh, for AI solutions. And I like to say algorithms get all the press. Everyone talks about that, but it's actually the richness of the data uh, that leads to the success. So the demand for the infrastructure needed to do this expands at the same rate as the demand uh, for AI. And that's why we see a tremendous uh, increase in, in the demand for new types of data infrastructure um, and investments by companies. Uh, third, third thing driving artificial intelligence is that AI has to continue to learn. Just like a human, it's not static. It has to learn and has to learn in perpetuity. And that's because the environment changes, regulatory changes in financial services, uh, world changes, market changes, uh, customer trend changes, or even the strategy of the company changes. And so too must uh, AI models uh, machine learning models, mathematical optimization models have to change as well. And in particular, machine learning uh, models are particularly uh, prone to decay uh, in their performance uh, because they're trained on historical data. If that historical data changes, you've got to change the model. Um, so models have to be monitored in production and absolutely retrained on newer data and perhaps even be remodeled uh, uh, because maybe someone has a hypothesis that there's a new data point that will lead to an even better accuracy of that model. So models have to be retrained. In some cases, they're, they're retrained as frequently uh, as daily. I was talking to um, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon uh, Prime video and they retrain models continuously on recommendation engines because the recommendation engine is that fraud models, for example, um, financial services institutions, they, they don't train those uh, daily, uh, but there's a frequency of change, change so that they can uh, identify those uh, threat signatures. Uh, so AI models, you have to have a solution that allows you to monitor the efficacy of those models and, and change them. And one of the things you'll see in our data uh, of this study is that there's a desire to change optimization strategies and model uh, and, and machine learning models uh, faster. So whatever AI infrastructure was needed to do that machine learning model or, or represent that models needed in perpetuity. And the fourth one uh, is about automation as well. Um, yes, AI can, there's use cases about insight, like providing insight for human decision. And these can be huge consequential decisions that companies make, like an op, a mathematical optimization model to determine where to play, where to expand your next hundred retail outlets, for example. Um, so there's some very big decisions, but there's also decisions that get made routinely, like should we up the credit limit for this customer? Um, sh uh, how should we rebalance our portfolio? So the inferencing side of this um, it is also very important. And it's being pushed out into every aspect of work. Um, it, it has to do with automation. It has to do with customer engagement. Has to, it's even making its way into uh, uh, a lot more consumer items like self-driving cars. So it has to be infused into existing uh, enterprise and customer facing applications. So in thinking about AI, and the technologies that you use to implement AI, it has to be embedded uh, in existing applications. So it's all about deployment. Um, uh, and because it is a fundamental technology, um, uh, if it goes down, business is gonna go down too. So it's not sort of an experimental thing. So when we think of artificial intelligence, uh, we think of three things working together, data, Right, and both machine learning models and optimization models need data. The, the way they need the data is differently. Machine learning models need a whole bunch of data to analyze it, to find a trend that, it, that essentially can create a predictive model. Optimization, 
needs absolute critical variable data to understand uh, what the constraints are uh, in terms of the decisions it's going to uh, automate and come up with. But this is sort of the, the, the three critical components of the best uh, and, and smartest AI solutions. Um, and this is one of the reasons why AI is the fastest growing technology on the planet, because it needs a lot of data, it needs a lot of compute, and there's a lot of use cases that are, that are unimplemented. Um, so uh, another data point from our study uh, is that all of the respondents agree that there's benefits to adjusting their op optimization strategy frequently, because this was, this was a key question that we wanted to uncover here. Are you doing an optimization model, a decision model, an AI solution, and just leaving and setting it and forgetting it? Or because I think that was more of the past. The world is changing a lot faster. It's getting more competitive, especially in a, uh, in a world of digital transformation. Uh, so clearly, uh, uh, companies want to be able to change uh, these strategies, change the optimization, change the AI models uh, much faster. Um, and we also uh, explored, well, what are the benefits if, if you can change that faster? Well, it's the normal benefits, right? Reducing costs, responding to market changes, managing risk better, all of the things that financial services have to do to be successful, uh, they associate with changing the, the strategy more frequently. And the net of that is you need a platform, you need a, a, a tooling, a platform technology that allows you to not only change it very, very quickly, but also know when you need to change it as well. Um, and the benefits that companies expect um, greater profitability, competitive advantage, uh, increase processing speed. Um, and those sort of line up with, with when we ask them, well, if you combine mathematical optimization and machine learning, uh, those same benefits uh, line up. So, you know, this is, a, this is a very big trend, we believe. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Ed uh, and he's gonna uh, go a, a, a lot deeper on financial services and and how this will all actually work. Ed, over to you. So as Mike mentioned, I'm gonna dive a bit deeper into mathematical optimization in finance, talk about um, how it's used, uh, some of the pluses, some of the minuses as well. So, and first off, I'm gonna actually cover a bit of history. So um, if you look at the history of optimization and the history of computational finance, um, there's a lot of overlap. Um, so they've really, they've, they've really co-evolved over the last 70 years. Um, and starting at the very beginning, so if you look at uh, the pioneers of the field, so George Danzig was a pioneer in mathematical optimization, and Harry Markowitz was a pioneer in computational finance. Uh, so, so, and they both worked in the early 1950s. They actually worked together at the RAND Corporation in the early 50s. Uh, so George Danzig developed the simplex method in 1947, which remains 70 years later, remains the fundamental building block of modern mathematical optimization. And Terry Markowitz in the early 50s was working on portfolio selection, basically uh, using uh, mathematics to balance uh, return and risk. Um, he actually used the simplex method for portfolio selection. He actually won a Nobel Prize in economics in 1990. So, you know, uh, deep connections from the very beginning, and these have continued over, over the last 70 years. Uh, to a point where if you ask people, you know, if, if, you're gonna, uh, if, if you want to use mathematical optimization in finance, what are the opportunities? And people just reflexively say, oh, yeah, that's portfolio optimization, uh, just because of these deep historical ties between the two areas. Uh, but if you dig a bit deeper, what you find is that the opportunities for using optimization in finance are quite a bit broader than that. Um, so let me, let me give you a, a bit of context when it comes to applications of mathematical optimization. Uh, so one thing we did uh, several years ago was we actually looked at all of our customers and looked at the industries they're in um, and just made a list. Uh, and so you, you can see the list here. There's about 40 different industries that we came up with. Um, so mathematical optimization is a pretty quite broadly applicable technology, and it shows up in many different industries. 
And if you look at um, places where optimization is used that are relevant for uh, financial institutions, so there are a few that are you know obvious: portfolio management, of course, and finance. Um, there are a few that are probably less obvious: so accounting, energy trading, facility location. Um, sourcing, workforce management, and and then there's one that's probably particularly unintuitive, which is uh, petroleum optimization. So there are actually uh, significant applications of the techniques used early on for doing petroleum refining in finance. So I'll say a few more words about that, a few more words about that shortly. Um, so, you know, if you look at uh, places in a modern uh, financial services uh, institution or organization that can use optimization. So I've listed a few examples here. Um, the, I mean, the key point is a financial firm, it's a multifaceted enterprise. So sure, it does, you know, it manages portfolios, but it does so much more. And a lot of the things it does, optimization has uh, relevance to those. So give me a, a few examples. So credit card offerings. So, you know, you want to offer, you want to uh, send out offerings to potential customers to, to increase adoption of credit cards. So this is marketing campaign optimization. It's a common ap op application of optimization. Uh, you know, let's say you're building a, a network of branches and you want to decide where to place your branches to maximize traffic, to minimize travel time, what have you. So this is a network design optimization. Again, a common optimization application across a number of industries. Uh, let's say you're doing retail banking and you want to set up uh, appointments for uh, you know, people to meet with advisors. So this is manpower scheduling, again, a common optimization application. Uh, if you've got a network of ATM machines and you know, they have, a, they have a, a consumable resource, which is cash. And so when it gets low, you have to send a, you know, basically a truck out to refill them. Um, so figuring out the best way to do this for a large network of ATMs is transportation optimization. Um, securitization. So this is where the connection to petroleum comes into play. So in petroleum, it's, it's quite common to have a set of products that you want to produce, you know, uh, different octanes of gasoline. And so you want to produce a sort of a uniform set of products, but you've got a non-uniform set of inputs, which are basically the the oil that's been drilled from certain fields with different, different properties. And what you have to do is you have to blend these non-uniform inputs together in order to achieve certain uniformity in the, in the results. Um, so this is you know, a big application in petroleum. It's also a big application when it comes to um, creating securities in finance. So you've got a bunch of you know, inputs, whether they're, um, uh, whether they're uh, stocks, bonds, Mortgages, what have you, each has a certain, a certain set of properties. You want to blend them together to create a, you know, a, a, a whole, a uniform a whole product that has certain properties. Um, so just a few examples. There are others, you know, portfolio optimization, of course, portfolio replication, trade sentiment, and there's a long list of applications of optimization within financial services. All right, so what makes uh, optimization you know, what makes it applicable in such a broad range of problems and what makes it interesting. So the main thing that um, makes it relevant is that it is a declarative modeling approach. And this phrase probably doesn't mean much, so I will, I will dive a bit deeper. First, let me talk about what it means for it to be declarative. So mathematical optimization uh, is declarative, means that you declare a set of facts about your desired solution. You basically say, I want a solution that satisfies these constraints, that, maximize, that maximizes this objective. Um, and you don't actually indicate how to find such solutions. You just state uh, the facts, the, the, the properties that solutions have. And then an optimization solver like Garobi, Garobi will perform a search. It'll consider all the possible solutions that satisfy these constraints and return the one that maximizes the objective. Uh, so the alternative to a declarative approach is a procedural approach. Uh, in a procedural approach, you basically give a list of steps, a process for, for finding a solution. So optimization is declarative modeling. Let me say a few words about modeling. Um, so modeling is, I mean, it's, it's quite simple. You basically build a model of how your system behaves. And this is in contrast to a data-based approach. 
where you gather a set of data and then you have a system that tries to draw conclusions from that data. So you can think of an optimization model as a, it's, it's, it's a nice analogy we borrowed from uh, process engineering. You can think of it as a digital twin for your business process. So, you know, in, in process engineering, you have a, a digital twin is basically a computer that simulates the behavior of a machine. Um, in optimization, you know, an optimization model is a computer model that, that simulates the behavior of a business process. It doesn't have to be a physical process but just captures the behavior of that process. Um, and the intent is that it should capture the behavior for all possible inputs. Um, and in the case of mathematical optimization, uh, one of the, a few of the nice properties you get from a, from a um, optimization model, from a model-based approach, is we also provide a lower bound on the best possible solution. So when we find a solution, not only do we provide, provide a solution that satisfies your constraints, but we also give an indication of the, the, the largest possible improvement that could be made to that solution. Um, so, and, you know, maybe that's, that guarantee is, you know, you can't, you couldn't possibly improve that solution by more than 10%. Maybe the guarantee is 1%. Maybe you've found the true optimal solution. It depends really on um, the problem and, and how long you're willing to wait. So let me talk about some of the trade-offs of a model-based approach against a data-based approach. And in particular, so model-based, this is mathematical optimization, a data-based approach, this is machine learning. Um, so, and Mike, Mike touched on this a bit. So a model-based approach doesn't rely on historical data. It relies on someone actually building a model that captures the behavior of the system. And so some advantages of this approach, um, so you don't need a mountain of training data. You don't need lot, lots of historical data. Um, and you know, this, is, this can be quite nice in some situations because either the data may not be you know, very good, you may not have a lot. In some cases, you may not have any at all. Um, so another advantage of a model-based approach is that um, you don't need to worry that uh, all the important scenarios are captured in the training data. So if there's some scenarios that are you know, particularly problematic, particularly difficult, and they're not captured in the training data, then they can't possibly be captured in the conclusions that are drawn from the training data. Um, and then a similar point is that you know, when it comes to model drift. So if you're building a model based on historical data, it's, you know, it's, it's gonna try and capture some properties of the, of the behavior of the system you know, in, that, in that period of history. And if the behavior changes, then your model isn't necessarily going to ac accurately capture the, uh, the, 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 the important properties of the, of the system. Um, and in a lot of cases, you won't even know that the, 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 the um, model has drifted. So you may wind up working on uh, uh, using a model that's been trained on data that is no longer relevant for the current situation. Uh, but of course, the downside to a model-based approach is you've got to build the model. Um, so a data-based approach like machine learning, you hand it a pile of data and with, with a bit of configuration, basically it will go and find um, patterns. It'll go and find, uh, it'll recognize information in the data. Whereas a, a model-based approach, you actually have to build the model. All right, let me talk a bit about the trade-offs between a declarative approach and a procedural approach. So declarative is again, mathematical optimization. Um, procedural approach, heuristics are a good example of procedural approaches. Um, so declarative approach, one advantage is that it's a, it's a general solution approach. So a declarative approach is not built to solve a particular problem. It's built to accept a description of the problem and then go and find solutions. Um, and so one nice property of, of this behavior is that if you make a change to your model, you know, business, business situation changes, something changes, you make a change to the model. Uh, the declarative approach, had, it, it wasn't assuming anything about the, uh, about the problem. And so if you make a change, you, you know, enhance your model. And so at that point, you've just got a different model, a different declarative model. And, you know, the, the solver, the, uh, the engine that knows how to solve such problems, it's basically, it, it's, it's meant to deal with whatever problem you hand it. 
Whereas with a procedural approach, you specify, you have a heuristic, specify a certain procedure. If the problem changes, that procedure may no longer be effective. And so you may have to, you know, substantially modify your heuristic or potentially even rewrite it. Another advantage of a declarative approach is it's, in general, it's easier to understand what's going on. Um, it's, I should, it's not trivial, but um, basically if someone wants to figure out what the declarative approach is doing, what the model-based approach is doing, uh, you basically get a list of the declarations, a, a list of the, the, the facts that have been stated about that problem. And then that basically describes the problem that's, that's, that's being solved. And so if you understand the facts that are being stated, then you understand what problem you're solving. Uh, whereas a procedural approach, you know, potentially it's, it's encapsulated in thousands of lines of, of code. And it's not uncommon for a heuristic to only be understood by the person who wrote that heuristic. It's not trivial to go digging through thousands of lines of code to figure out what's going on. Another advantage of a declarative approach is you get passive improvement. So once you build your model, once you describe you know, the constraints, the set of solutions. So um, we at Gorobi, we, we work hard to improve our product from one release to the next. And you know, over time we've gotten some pretty, we've delivered some pretty significant improvements in the overall performance of the product. And so if you've described your problem in a way that we understand and we make improvements to our product, then your model gets better. Um, whereas a procedural approach, you've written some code and, you know, maybe computers get a bit faster, but, you know, for the most part, that code is that code. And in order to make improvements, you have to actually change the code. Uh, another advantage of a declarative approach is it's systematic, so it will explore the space. It'll find the best solution eventually. It, you know, how long it takes depends on the problem. Um, some cases, you'll find the optimal solution in seconds. In other cases, you know, you may have to settle for a solution where the gap is, you know, a few percent. Uh, a heuristic approach in general is not going to do a systematic search of the space, so it may miss some high-quality solutions. Um, and then finally, bound information, uh, you get, as I mentioned earlier, you get bound information. So you get guarantees on the quality of your solution. Um, when it comes to a heuristic approach, you know, you potentially get a high quality solution, but you don't necessarily know that it's a high quality solution. Um, so, and there are advantages to a procedural approach. So a procedural approach, if you're building a, a solution that is specific to the problem you're trying to solve, it can be faster. Um, and so it's, it's, it's common for heuristics to be able to find uh, solutions quickly. Um, you don't, as I mentioned, you don't necessarily know how good they are, but um, oftentimes you can find them quite quickly. And then um, when it comes to specialized skills, so for a procedural approach for a heuristic, so other than you know, the skill of being able to study your problem, try to understand how to build a, an effective approach to solving the problem, to finding a solution to the problem, um, you know, once you've done that, it's just a, a matter of writing code. So, you know, anyone who uh, has the ability to code has the ability to build a heuristic, whereas optimization, it's, you know, it's a skill. So it does require some, some training, some knowledge. All right. So actually, this is my, this, this, this is my, to, this is my last slide to, to, to conclude, or actually it's, uh, second to last slide. So, you know, if you've, if you've heard what I've said and you're interested in, you know, uh, in building and looking at building an optimization model. So um, let me say a few words about some of the ingredients for optimization, optimization success. Some of the things we've learned from our customers about what it takes to actually succeed with optimization. Um, so first thing you need is you need a problem that involves multiple activities that are competing for scarce resources. So, you know, if you don't have constraints, then really there's not a lot of complexity in your problem and there's not really a need for a sophisticated approach to solving it. Um, so you need data. So you don't need, as, as I mentioned, you don't need as much data as you do for a machine learning approach, for a data-based approach, but you still do need data that allows you to capture the state of your system. So, you know, if you're gonna try and build, find an optimal solution for, you know, taking some action, um, I, you know, ultimately it's going to be based on your current state and you need the data that actually accurately describes the current state. Uh, you need a well-formed objective function. So you need a very precise uh, definition of what it exactly it is you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to minimize, what you're trying to maximize, you know, minimize cost, maximize profit, whatever. 
And then you need a, you know, a data scientist, someone with a, you know, a, a mathematical background that can systematically look at your business, uh, your business process and tease out, you know, what the objective is, what the constraints are and state them in the appropriate form in a form that a mathematical optimization solver can uh, accept. Um, in, you know, I mentioned earlier that one of the downsides of a model-based approach is you have to build the model, which can, you know, can be more work. Uh, but one thing we hear over and over from customers is that you shouldn't necessarily view that as strictly as a, as a chore, as a task, uh, because what people find is that just the process of looking at their business process, trying to understand what exactly it is that they're trying to achieve, what the objective is, trying to understand what the constraints are, trying to gather the data that captures those constraints. So that process actually provides significant value in and of itself. So the, you know, the journey is the reward. Oftentimes the, the process of building the optimization model of, of, of coming up with a declarative model of how your business process works provides as much value as the model that you get as a result. All right, so um, if you wanna learn more there, we've got three finance related case studies on our website. Uh, so the first is uh, Robico, which is a company that uses Groby to optimize fixed income portfolios for um, private investors. Then this is this blending problem that I mentioned earlier. So you have a, they have a, uh, their clients have a set of securities, you know, maybe they have bonds with uh, you know, maturity dates, returns, and they want to uh, create a portfolio of, um, of these securities in order to achieve some global goal. Uh, Swissquant, uh, another customer of ours, they use Groby to do portfolio optimization for private banking customers. So this is a very traditional optimization finance application. They've got uh, customers, they, they, the customers have certain goals and they want to, and, and they use the software to build a portfolio of securities to meet these goals. And then finally, Wincorn Nixdorf actually uses Groby to do what they call cash logistics, where they're basically shipping a commodity from, from a, uh, a, a warehouse to uh, retail locations. But in this case, the commodity is cash uh, and the, the retail locations are ATM machines. So they re, they're using uh, Groby to figure out the most efficient way to restock their ATM machines. So to learn more, we've got uh, additional resources on our website. Uh, you can get a 30 day trial of our software um, and feel free to contact us if you have more questions. Thank you.